Um, I would say I was much more prepared this time than another time before. Let me get to the other time before now. So I was scaling very aggressively. Then COVID came and I had three or four closing as a new investor. Ooh, that's a lot of closings uh, uh, to, to get done. And I was only in the game for probably a year and a half to two years. So <laughs> not enough equity on my other properties uh, at that point. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to bankrupt me if the real estate market just like, you know, completely tanks from now because I can't close on these three or four properties. And that was a huge realization moment to me. Oh my God. Like I, I was scaling way too aggressively. I need to tone things back. And when things are hot, it's easy to scale. But when th- the tides can change quickly in real estate, right? Yeah. Hey, fellow savvy real estate investors. Thanks for tuning in. We have Austin Ye on our show today. And for those of you who don't know Austin, he is definitely a young and um, extremely successful investor, especially for somebody who's uh, recently started out, um, you know, has a couple years of investing under his belt. Uh, Definitely wise beyond his years. Uh, He is the uh, founder of Ontario Property Deals, which uh, is primarily focused on wholesaling. He does some buy and hold work. Uh, which we'll talk a lot about here and in terms of how he's able to creatively find deals. And he's also got his podcast as well, which is um, the Rise podcast. And he does a lot of outreach for younger folks, uh, putting together events um, and really encouraging, I think, a lot of the younger generation to start thinking about their exit not necessarily their exit from the corporate world, but also thinking about investing in general and how that can tie in together. So um, I hope that was somewhat of a you know brief introduction, but I think Austin will do a better job telling you more about himself. <laughs> so uh, Austin, thank you for coming on the show today. Um, tell us a little bit about you and you know what got you into investing, especially at such a young age. And I mean, not that age is, you know, age is just a number, but I think that a lot of people at you know, when like 23, 22, 23, 24, that's when people are finishing school, they're starting their careers, they're really focused on their careers, they've gone to school or whatnot. Um, And, you know, they haven't really burnt out yet, is, is my opinion. Like, you know, when you're just just getting into it, you haven't hit that point of like, frustration yet. So what, allowed you to, you know, hit this point so much earlier and exit from your corporate career and look at, you know, real estate investing? I know those are a lot of questions, but yeah, maybe just give us a little bit of your background and, and how you got here. Absolutely. Really appreciate the introduction. And it's an honor being on this podcast. I'm um, kind of touching on what you were saying is, yeah, so I guess to give you a little background on myself, um, Originally, when I was younger, my parents, being being of Asian descent, wanted me to become a doctor, which I didn't do. I, I went into business because I found it much, much. Uh, I found it much easier than than the sciences. Um, so going into business, uh, I went to UFT, did multiple internships. So one of the things you mentioned were, was burning out, right? My first internship was actually at Price Waterhouse Coopers in audit. Um, and anyone who knows the audit lifestyle, it is not easy, and the pay is 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 not great, right? So I was getting paid about. 39,000 annualized from our first co-op term. And I was working from 8 a.m. until 1 or 2 a.m. Um, so long, long, long hour shifts on, wow. on weekends yeah, as well. Yeah, it was busy season. <laughs> there was no mercy on a co-op. And, and that immediately in my head is like, okay, like if this is kind of what my life is going to be all about, I cannot handle this, right? There's not enough money that will make me sustain this over the long term. That being said, I tried a couple of other internships. So I did uh, tech consulting, um, which wasn't really passionate in strategy and business planning and Hydro One still didn't find it something that resonated with me. Then I started my first full-time job and, and likewise, like I just didn't resonate with it. But every single job got progressively better. I found out what I like and what I didn't like about a job, but still it wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't feel uh, satisfied or or happy, right? I was doing everything right. Good grades, did everything my parents told me to, um, getting these good jobs, but still feeling constantly unsatisfied. And it just, I don't know, I guess it's just the way I was thinking, is this what life is all about? I'm just going to have to do this rat race forever, which I was not okay with, right? So it led me into dabbling into stocks a bit, which, um, Again, like if anyone's looking for fast money in stocks, it's it's not the way to go. Trading is 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 not. I know some people who are profitable in it. I definitely wasn't. Um, so I was like, okay, this stocks thing didn't work out. My friend recommended me to read the Rich Dad Poor Dad book, which I'm sure everyone in your audience is familiar with that book by now. Um, but that really got my my head spinning and and thinking that real estate is an asset that could 
produce me passive income to eventually retire from my my nine to five job. And uh, being 23, having $40,000 saved up, Toronto wasn't going to make sense. Couldn't even buy a parking spot with $40,000. Um, so I just simply did Google searching on what cities I could afford, right? Maybe not the best way because I didn't look into the macro fundamentals of every city, but I was super eager to jump on board. And I saw that Windsor was an extremely affordable city. I could get in to a house with less than $30,000 down payment with 20% down. Fantastic. So went down there, made every mistake you can make in the book when when dealing with my uh, first investment property. I contacted a listing agent, right? And uh, listing agents like, this property sold, come down. I'll show you a ton of other properties. So we looked at five or six properties. She's like, which one do you want? And I was like, I guess I have to buy something because she spent so much time taking me through all the property. So I just bought the cheapest one and that catapulted my my real estate career. A lot of mistakes made on that one, but I'm kind of happy I also took action and, and jumped the gun because it led me to where I am today. Absolutely. No, and, and you know what? Um, your background actually is quite similar because we started, I started in the engineering field, um, uh, but we also looked for the cheapest market and we ended up in Windsor, Ontario as well. <laughs> this is back in 2009. Um, and and uh, we we thought buying the cheapest uh, is the best way. But of course, that you know comes with a set of problems. Not that problems are can't be solved, but you know you're you know attracting a lower quality tenant and more delinquencies and you got to go through evictions. So Tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you were faced with. Absolutely. I'll tell you, if you want, I can even tell you recent challenges up to today, right? Because yeah. no investor continues to scale without like their headaches. Exactly what you were saying is, is tenant quality is, is an issue uh, in, in Windsor, uh, depending on which neighborhood you're investing in, right? Like one of the things I've learned is not everything is considered in a pro forma when you build financials. Numbers can look super juicy, but if you're mm -hmm. buying in a terrible neighborhood, that's why it looks super juicy because the acquisition price is really low. And I didn't keep things th these things into consideration when buying. So in Windsor, still invest there, but I invest in the better pockets now. There's a property I purchased in a terrible neighbor, uh, neighborhood of Windsor, in, in downtown Windsor. Um, it was a four unit. It was filled with drug uh, addicts or, or drug dealers, mix of both um was able to do cash yeah i was i was getting ahead of myself but was able to do cash for keys with all of them and then boom the pandemic hit and then evictions were held back no evictions were allowed so none of them left on their agreed upon date um and then we got an uh, like a sheriff's notice that saying that said they have to be they have to leave on this date but the sheriff wouldn't show up because again there's no forced evictions now and what ended up happening so they stayed there they squatted people were going in and out breaking out uh, breaking in the house um and then someone lit the house on fire so i got a call at night from my partner saying like hey well he got a call at night and I didn't pick up because it was 11 p.m. So I was like, whatever. And then he called me again. I was like, oh, God, OK, this is not good if you're calling twice. And then he said, look, the Windsor police called and our house is on fire. I was like, OK, like this is not good news, but maybe it's just like small. Um, and then the next day we didn't get no update throughout the entire night. So I had a sleepless night. And then I Googled our property on um, on Google, obviously. And then I saw an article saying that the entire house burnt down. Someone passed oh. away. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah. So, so my heart dropped, right? It's like, oh my God, like I have to get a lawyer. Um, I don't know, like, is there, is there negligence on my end? Cause the property was in disrepair, hence why we needed to do the cash for keys. All of that stuff accumulated to a lot of stress, found out that a week later it was an arsonist that probably had beef with someone in the building and just let the entire property down. Um, long story short, <clears throat> made me realize that not everything is built in a pro forma, right? Absolutely. Like you got to understand location makes a huge difference. So I will not touch bad locations with a 10 foot pole. Now I just want in, in good location, stable tenant quality um, tenants that are going to make rent and tenants that are not going to cause trouble, even if it means accepting a lower return on paper, but over the long term, it usually does. Absolutely. These, these worst yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> kind of reminds me of what we went through because <laughs> you know what? Exactly the same thing. I kid you not. We we were dealing with a lot of drug dealing tenants, and uh, we also had a fire 
in one of our uh, fourplex. Mm. Luckily, the whole thing didn't burn down, but uh, one of the units and then another adjacent unit got affected. So we had to go through a whole insurance ordeal for the for over you no know, almost twelve months. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I mean, talk to us. Like, let's just <clears throat> let's just talk about like you know, okay, there's this this physical thing that's happening, and there's all of this, but I mean. I think that, you know, people don't talk about the mental side of this and, 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 you know, it's like the mental endurance that you need to sometimes survive. And I think that, especially when you're younger, I mean, at least I speak from experience when we were younger, there was nobody who understood what we were going through. Mm -hmm. Like your parents don't understand. You can't go over there and say, Hey, like, can you help me out with this issue? Your siblings don't understand. Your friends don't understand. Uh, You're, you're, you're essentially going through a lot of this on your own. And, you know, Talk to us about that. Like, talk to us about the struggles of an investor or or being young, maybe not even young of any age, starting out and having these these issues and and how you overcome them and and what is it about you know what traits do you think that you you have that allowed you to persevere? Because a yeah. lot of times, like at this point, people are going to throw in the towel. They're like, hey, mm-hmm. you know what? This is way too much for me. Like, I can't handle this. I don't want to be called at 11 o'clock at night. I don't want to deal with this fire. I, nobody wants to deal with all those struggles, right? Mm-hmm. So what do you think allowed you to continue to move forward and to handle these things? And especially because, you know, you you are younger and, and you don't have that support around you. Mm-hmm. I think a big part of it is, is that Things have changed a little bit now, given that there's a lot of investor communities for you to, you know, get that support and, and help from. That being said, with this entire situation, I didn't really lean on it too much um, because I didn't. It was an ongoing investigation, so I didn't want to be telling everyone. I think part of it is is that uh, problem solving is, is one of the things, right? And when you're investing in real estate, generally you have a high tolerance, not a high tolerance of risk, but you 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 are tolerable to risk. You know that things can happen, right? Um, Loss. I've learned much more from my losses in investing in general than than the wins. Right, the wins have actually been the one that have dragged me further down in my journey. Make like, and that's similar with a lot of real estate investors where they're winning so much, so they take on twenty flips, and then now they're they're struggling to pay down. We've seen this right now. All of those wins get into your head, right? But like losses like this dragged me down into reality, and I'm I'm quite happy. Well, not that the house one. I'm happy that I face these losses sooner than later in my journey. Absolutely. 100%. You know what? I, that, that's such a great point because that's the same thing that happened to us early on. We were in our twenties too. And with all of this stuff happening, we got you no know, kind of thicker skin to deal with these problems. Right. So now when we deal with problems, it's like, it's not a big deal because we've gone through so much, yeah. you know, and sometimes, you know what? kind of going through the the these unpleasant moments uh dealing with the worst tenant profile actually makes you a stronger investor and it kind of you know makes you a more resilient investor because now you know what not to look for um you know and and avoid those things altogether you know mm-hmm. cuz sometimes like you said we were also buying in uh, Windsor we were buying in uh, uh kind of rougher areas of U- uh, the United States at the beginning and we would be faced with okay on performa or the cash on cash looks solid price point is so low but in reality you're going to be dealing with a lot more challenges yeah yeah you know yeah and one big issue can completely throw your performa out the door right yeah. like the performa doesn't mean anything yeah so um yeah i think you learn a lot more about the reality of investing performas are just one very small part of this whole game right mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, underwriting deals very aggressively based on multiple factors not just the numbers is something that 100%. i think you you come out with yeah, it's just like investing in a stock. You you took it. You take a look at the quantitatives, but there are a lot of qualitatives in and when when assessing whether to buy a stock or not. Right, management team. Um, mm-hmm. What are the goals over the? Or what are what is their vision over the next X amount of years? Right, like there are things that are never shown on a spreadsheet, but you need to analyze the qualitative factors of it. Yeah, absolutely. So so that was the the fire was the first deal that you did. No, no, that was like that was a little bit into my journey. Um, okay. If you want me to circle back, and I don't know if you guys want me to circle back into that yeah, first deal. Yeah, you no, know, I just kind of was. I'm curious as to. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you had some success along the way, and that's what kind of keep 
kept you yeah. doing more and more deals. Uh, so j- tell us a little bit about uh, kind of that journey. Yeah, for sure. So first deal, as I mentioned, bought the cheapest one that the realtor bought over to me. Didn't know what I was getting myself into. And then after I went clean on the property, I found an investing community in Windsor because I was like, okay, I went clean. Now I got to connect with the right people. So I almost did things a little bit backwards. Getting a property is like, let me figure everything out. I'll start. I'll just go through it, which I don't suggest for people. Like obviously you have your due diligence and your ducks in a row before you do it. Uh, but that was kind of my experience. And I realized that when I initially walked in the property, I thought it was going to be a $10,000 reno, but ended up doubling in budget. I ended up choosing the cheapest contractor, not necessarily the one that had a little bit higher price, but a better reputation. Mm-hmm. Um, so things where I was like pinching pennies, but it ended up costing me a lot more money and a lot more headache along the way. So that's another learning lesson quickly um, with my first property. But that being said, because of how rapid the market depreciation was, and I do acknowledge that it was it was quite rapid, especially in Windsor, um, I was able to refinance my property out. And I hit a little bit of luck too. My first tenant who moved in there paid me one year rent up front. Um, wow. I should I should have thought to my head, like, are they dealing drug or what's going on here? I, I didn't really get first property, so I wasn't thinking that far ahead. <laughs> um, but I had a lot of capital that's pulled back out from that first property to reinvest it in the second one. And I was just doing cosmetic single family deals, um, then moved into the duplex space. And then during that entire time, I was recording my story on Instagram, right? So first property going through all of the headaches, everything was documented on Instagram. So people were like relating or following along with me and it was not other real estate investors. This is just like general my friends, family, people who follow me on Instagram, right? And then I started having people reach out to me wanting to get into investing. Um, Potential joint ventureships came out of that. Uh, And then I decided to hold a little meetup in in Toronto because there was, I I guess a lot of it is action taking. Like for me, it was just like figuring out something and then just like doing it immediately, which has got me in a bad situation, but it's got me to a lot of good, like good possibility uh, situations as well and opportunities. So I saw that there wasn't a meetup for young people in Toronto, like newer investors. So I started hosting that and that evolved into Rise Network, which is 7,100 people in our Facebook community now. Um, and we usually have 150 to 200 and 200 people attend our events just, just oh, from wow. that one meetup that had a few people come out to the first one. That's amazing. No, I mean, you know, the fact that you have done so much in a short period of time, um, you know, you built this, you were obviously focused on investing in your uh, building a portfolio. And then now, uh, you know, you develop the community. So tell us, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of go back into you, um, just, just kind of touch on this. You read this, like, how did you come across this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, in the, to begin with? Uh, what, was your family into real estate or um, business entrepreneurship? Like who, who kind of uh, sparked the, sparked fire, the yeah. fire? Yeah. Yes. So in RBC, uh, there's a there's a person that I was buddies with who who owns one investment property, and then we would always talk about it. Uh, and then we're studying together to become realtors. I, I didn't go down that path of becoming a realtor, but we're just studying like our minds are turning about real estate. And it's like, hey, why don't you read this book? Because I would be motivated, then not motivated, then motivated, and be like, ah, like I was one foot in and one foot out. Um, and he's like, this book really helped him kind of turn the wheels of, of his thinking. And it, it was the same thing for me. It was nothing technical that came out of the book. Like you don't read that book and you magically can invest in real estate. Yes. But what it does do is it changes your entire perspective on on kind of life as it is, right? And and not working for a paycheck and buying all of these fancy things, but instead investing that money into your future. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, mm-hmm. well, well said. Yeah. And so uh, talk to us about that exit from your corporate job. Like, why did you decide to do that? And, um, you know, when did that happen? Yeah. So at that point, when I was exiting my corporate job, I had about 18 or so properties. Um, It was a mix of solely owned and joint ventures, predominantly in Windsor. Now, I was generating cash flow from that portfolio. But that being said, um, I also didn't always feel comfortable living off of cash flow, knowing that um, there could be things that come up and I would have to pay it down, right? So my cash flow could be eroded. So during that time when I was kind of thinking, 
you know what? I really want to plunge into plunge into real estate full time. I was figuring out ways to build active income. So I wholesaled a deal myself that I was planning on taking down myself, but I was like, let me see what I could do on the wholesaling side because I've never done it in the past. And I made about a $25,000 fee there. And that was at that time in RBC, I was making 75K a year. Um, so I was like, oh my God, this is like, you know, this is way more lucrative than 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 working a corporate job. And it took much less hours. Um, so then I wholesaled another deal, just like a two or three K fee, but still a lot, it's pretty much equivalent to a single paycheck. So I was like, okay, I need an active income stream. Uh flipping usually is not within. I, at that time, I wasn't huge on flipping, right? Like it's not within my risk criteria because flipping requires a decent amount of leverage. And a yeah. lot of the flips that people flip, they don't they don't work as long-term buy and holds, right? Unless I do like a cheaper flips, but I'd rather just hold in my, my portfolio then. Um, so I, I really like the idea of wholesaling, much less risk, um, less money to get into flipping. And in my opinion, more lucrative and more ability to scale up uh, with less leverage. So Waylon, who is my business partner in uh, Fast Ontario Home Buyer and Ontario Property Deals, he was starting, he was also like kind of new into the wholesaling game, but he's done a couple of successful uh, wholesales as well. So we decided to pool our resources together because he was really good on the on the sales and acquisition side. He does sales full time. Uh, he's, a, he's a tech lead. And for myself, I'm really good on the processes side because I've worked in consulting uh, and audit. So we pooled kind of our complementary skill sets together. And then we started this business. And once I started generating active income from that business. It gave me the confidence to leave my full-time job and to pursue real estate full-time. But the one advice I, I do want to give to people is, is that a lot of people say that you can live off a of cash flow. And that may that may have been true a while back where properties are much cheaper. But if you are, and a lot of people are like re-leveraging your properties as they go up in value, your cash flow erodes. You're basically buying it at market value, quote unquote, because that's what you're refining up to, right? A lot of the time. Yes. And it makes it a lot more people live off of refi checks than than cash flow, and that's the reality of it. But those refi checks are definitely pretty hefty. Uh, but real estate's a great wealth builder. It is. It is like a little bit. If you're doing traditional long term rentals, not short term rentals, it is. It is challenging to live solely off of that income. Hundred percent. I mean, we still at to this day we we don't we don't do that. You We've know, never lived off our rentals either. Yeah, yeah. it's we, always uh, been uh, separate. We've separated it in our minds. Yes. Like yeah. there's this stuff we do to build wealth and to create this long term. And I mean, maybe one day our goal is to live off of it, like as a retirement. Hey, like all these properties are going to be paid off and then it's a different world. Right. But um, at this moment, when you're building still and, you know, you're acquiring, like you said, and you're refinancing, you're doing all these things. Uh, it's certainly, I think, not in my in my humble opinion wise to 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 believe that that can replace your income especially if you have a good income like a good mm -hmm. high uh you know either six figure or close to six figure income um it's very difficult to be at a level where the cash flow is predictably um replacing that income and i think that mm -hmm. everybody wants this peace of mind ultimately right and and is this real estate portfolio going to give you that and my my answer to people is no because one big capital expenditure can completely wipe out the entire year's cash flow. Mm -hmm. One tenant who doesn't pay your rent in this day, in, in the current climate conditions, um, it could be a year of non-payment of rent. It could be. You have mm -hmm. to mentally prepare yourself for these, like you said, non-performa risks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is just the reality of it. But a long-term, it is an extremely lucrative wealth building tool. So exactly. yeah. Um, you know, uh, people understanding that there is real estate investing and then there is real estate as a uh, income generation and the income generation side of real estate. If you choose to have it, it, you don't have to do that. You can still invest in real estate and have another source of income. You could have mm -hmm. a business in, you know, you could have a plumbing business. You could have uh, a corporate job. You could have anything that you choose to, to as part of your active income. But what you did was you decided that you were going to use real estate to create an active income. And mm -hmm. once you had that confidence, you were able to leave your corporate job. So I think it's really important that people hear this. Um because a lot of times when you talk to investors, the conversation turns into, okay, like how many properties do I need before I can leave my job? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the answer is, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs>
Um, no, yeah. you're you're exactly right. Um, I almost look at it as you need a salary, and you can look at real or salary can be your business, and you look at real estate as your like equity options, right? Like you, it, you can't really live off of it, but it's that's going to build you more money than your actual salary over over the long term. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. I want to touch a little bit on the the management aspect of it. Uh, so all these properties that you have now in multiple cities and um uh how can what kind of management structure do you have in you know like you, do you usually just go and uh build relationship with property managers and then you do the uh, management asset management remotely from um so how do you yeah tell us a little bit about that yeah, that, that's exactly right. So I build relationships with with property managers in the local area. Um, yes, sometimes it, it could be a little bit cheaper to, if you have a sizable portfolio, to just do it in house. Um, at this point, I just haven't had the time time to do it. So I'll build relationships with property managers uh, and have. Usually I let them know that I'm going to be acquiring a decent amount of, of properties because usually when I invest in the city, I want to scale it. I just don't want to own one or two properties there. Yeah. And then we kind of work, depending on which property manager it is, we try to work some sort of discount. But there's cases where I I wouldn't say lucked out, I guess to an extent lucked out, but it was via networking where I found people who were just starting their property management companies. And I love those people because they will put in a lot of attention and time into your properties. A lot of love and care into it because they're they're hungry. They're trying to prove a point. They're not managing hundreds and hundreds of portfolio, uh, properties. That being said, um, also as their assets under management scale on the property management size or the ma- the amount of doors that they manage. Um, if you, I found that as long as I was a day one customer, treated them respect and helped them as well, because a lot of the time you kind of do help them build the systems out when they get started off. They yeah. will continue to show that respect and priority as they scale their portfolio. Just for an example, like in Windsor, my property manager right now, when he started off, I was one of his probably first 10 clients. And there were a lot of, there were some ups and downs throughout, but I would voice them to him and he would go and make the changes necessary, right? And even now in a bigger, like now he's managing 250, 300 units. I still have his phone number to call him directly. He has a bunch of employees now but I can still reach out to him directly, right? So I, I almost like finding the, the the secret property managers who are who are still scaling and growing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great point because, you know, that is really, you know, a lot of people underestimate that a uh, property manager, the management aspect of it can make or break you. If you're stuck with the wrong one, you know, they... They could. Uh, we've we've had uh, in Windsor, for example, our uh, we've gone through so many, and some even actually stole our money. Some we you know billing us for renovations, which never got completed. So, you know, we've been through a lot of uh, challenges as well. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. No, for sure. So, what does your portfolio look like right now, and in what cities are you investing? And maybe talk to us a little bit about the strategies that you're employing right now. I know that the market is definitely not what it used to be. Um, we're talking now, uh, you know, in 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 early 2023. It mm-hmm. is very different than a conversation that we could have had in uh, January 2022. Um, so I know that uh, things have changed and uh, being a young investor in that you've, you know, not seen as many cycles, like this is kind of, you've, you've been in sort of like we, we talked about a little bit offline, like, you know, you were in a really, really high and now things are, you know, obviously on the decline and and hopefully to a point where we're going to start to get to, to, to a steady market and even mm-hmm. market. Um, talk to us about what you're doing right now, uh, maybe in comparison to what you were doing before, how you're finding your deals, what markets you're primarily focusing on, and if there's a certain type of asset class that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say I was much more prepared this time than another time before. Let me get to the other time before now. So I was scaling very aggressively, then COVID came, and I had three or four closing as a new investor. Ooh, that's a lot of closings uh, uh, to, to get done. And I was only in the game for probably a year and a half to two years. So <laughs> not enough equity on my other properties uh, at that point. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to bankrupt me if the real estate market just like, you know, completely tanks from now because I can't close on these three or four properties. And that was a huge realization moment to me. Oh my God. Like I, I was scaling way too aggressively. I need to tone things back. And when things are hot, it's easy to scale. But when th- the tides can change quickly in real estate, right? Yeah. And it has before. So 
it, it changed my mentality. Fortunately, the market picked back up and I was able to get myself in a steady condition. But that being said, um, while everyone was buying extraordinarily aggressively over the past two years, um, I was buying at a steady pace I was comfortable with, right? So I was trying not to over leverage, trying not to take take too much private money. With some deals that may make sense, but I was trying to avoid it altogether, right? And just keep a balanced leverage portfolio. But at times during during the peak of the market, when people were making money hands over fist, it was almost like those who were, were taking more leverage were rewarded more greater. So I've gotten, I've, I've stepped out of my comfort zone one time and I wouldn't do it again. But during that peak market where I purchased something 140% loan to value, so renovations on private money, the property closed with private money, um, Fortunately, I was able to 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 turn around the building, stabilize it, and then refinance all the money out. That being said, yeah, the outcome was great. But that in, in that entire time when I was doing that deal, I was I was like having sleepless nights because I knew, okay, like if if this tenant really wanted to stay and not not uh, agree on our cash for keys or our N eleven, then we are not going to refi our property or like you know the number the pro formers are just going to change up. Um, got through that experience, and I was like, okay, like. Twice. It, it, I learned twice that it's not something I was comfortable with. So during February 2022, we actually sold a few properties off to deleverage our portfolio down more. We got rid of all of our private money. So that was priority number one. Um, like going into 2022, one of my goals is no private money. Let's get rid of it all. So got rid of all of it. So I was in a very fortunate position getting into it. And when the tides turned, there are yeah. a lot of people who were definitely struggling. Fortunately for me, it, it, it did impact my income. But the important part, it didn't impact my liquidity, right? I was still very, very liquid where I was like, okay, like my income got hit significantly on the wholesaling side, as I'm sure many wholesalers would probably agree with that. Um, but I wasn't stressed out because I was like, I'm still sitting on this pool of money because I was playing things conservatively, right? Um yeah. So going forward, like while the market was kind of falling off five, six percent every single month, I wasn't taking action because like who knew when the bottom was going to be. But as things started stabilizing, maybe declines of one or two percent a month, I was like, okay, like this is like a little bit more. I can operate with that, right? Not like not like sporadically five or six month over month drops. Um, at that point, I was like, let me re-enter the market and try to be as creative as possible. The biggest risk for me. Um, so just to let you guys know, I invest in the small multifamily side now. So like three, four, five, six units, seven units around that space. And the biggest risk is, is like the pro forma is like, what is the vacancy is going to look like on closing? What is the vacancy is going to look like in year one, two, how is that going to impact value? Right. And I was like, okay, like what's the, like a lot of these numbers still didn't work as is, uh, because the sellers are valuing it on asset value, not on the, not on the net operating income. And yeah. I'm not going to. I'm not paying you on your asset value, uh, maybe to a certain extent, but that's not it. Uh, so what I negotiated in is, look, like I am more willing to come closer to your asset value if you give me the opportunity to to like speak with the tenant, see if any of them are willing to transition. And if not, then yeah, like the deal's not going to make sense as is. I have to bow out of it, right? But but throwing out enough of those offers, there are a lot of no's, but there are a couple of yeses as well. And those deals turned out to be home runs in this in this environment. So I purchased four properties in November, November 2022. So pretty like three months ago. Um, mm -hmm. And of all of those four accumulated 15 units, all 15 units are turned over because of that, like that ability to be created. And having the seller be on side with that. And the ones that um, were respectably so, the tenants like elderly, they want to stay there, have no interest in leaving. I didn't have to do those deals. So I didn't assume those risks, right? Uh, but that's what I'm doing right now. And uh, it's been working wonders. Like all of the, like I sold one of them for a hundred, hundred K more than I bought it for in, in a month or less than a month, in a week. On closing, someone came to like, I'll buy it at this. I was like, okay, perfect. Let me get rid of this property. And the other three, we're going to go on refis at the end of this month, but we're able to refinance. Let's call it like 15 units turned around. Basically, we're able to refi all of them within the first three to four months from closing date until, until the refi point. Because by closing, the properties are usually vacant or we have to wait a month and it'll be vacant. And a lot of them are not like overly extensive renos. They are still like decent amount of renos, but I'm not like 
not enough renos where I have to pull permits for them. But that's mm-hmm. kind of the game plan and, and strategy that I've been by I've been implementing now, getting super creative and thinking of clauses that mitigate downside risk. Yeah. No, and are you no. buying these off market? No, some I would say three of them are on the market. And all of them were listings that just sat on there. So I'll give you an example of one. One of them was in Sudbury. It sat on there for 80 days. It was three units. And I literally called. I was like, look, the numbers don't work. What was the feedback you got from the buyers? And the buyers were like, yeah, the numbers don't work. I was like, all right. So like, I'm telling you the same thing. What can we do here? Like, is there any chance that you think the seller can get vacancies? She's like, yeah. I was like, did no one ask you for vacancies before? She's like, no. I was like, well, she should have suggested it, but she never suggested it. I was like, okay, like, could we get it fully vacant? She's like, yeah. I was like, okay, fantastic. Because two of the tenants are related to the seller. So the seller could transition them into any of any other units. Right. Um, and that one tenant, I guess they paid them out or whatever to leave. But I, I ended up with a vacant property just because people were not willing to just have those conversations. It's cold calling. Um, cause I'm not relying on buyer agents. I'm, I'm looking on listings actively on the MLS and I call the listing agents directly, right? I almost cut the middleman out and I just call the listing agents and I'm like, Hey, no, you had this property listed. Let's like cut to the chase. What's the feedback you got? Okay. Like, what can we do to make this work? They're like, they're not willing to come down in price. Okay. So what else can we do in terms, right? Mm-hmm. To make it work if they're not willing to come down in price. So right. I'm just looking at stale listings and just cold calling every realtor mm-hmm. on there. Amazing. That's awesome. And you're primarily focused in, like you said, small markets. So um, give our listeners an idea of markets that are, you know, because I think that a lot of people are just all competing in the same same ring, right? So everyone's mm-hmm. kind of looking at the GTA. We're looking at, I mean, for, for our Toronto and Ontario listeners, um, like everyone's like, oh, caught up on, you know, Hamilton, Oshawa, Barrie, um, like kind of the surrounding markets uh, up to, I think a lot of people like St. Catharines, um, yeah. you know, but everybody's kind of looking for deals in the exact same space. So mm-hmm. talk to us maybe about like some other markets that could be lucrative that are just, you know, like, and we talked about this a little bit before, if you're going to go outside, if you're going to go outside of your home and you're going to become a quote unquote remote investor to some degree, then it doesn't really matter where you go um, as long as you can mm-hmm. build systems out in that location. So um, maybe tell us some markets that you think are are great to focus on some smaller markets. Yeah. So I still focus on Windsor, believe it or not. I don't know if you consider it small market shirt. Sure, it's a secondary market. Yeah. Um, so I still focus on Windsor. The cash flow is definitely eroded a little bit given, you know, the values there went up quite significantly. But again, like it's all about finding finding the right deal. Um, and as long again, if, if it's still able to cash flow after refi. And I'm able to get a full burr. I, I I really don't mind in which market I go to, right? Um, I don't know. It's like most of the strategies that I talk about, I feel like they're they're able to be done in almost any market. Like I'm sure there are p- investors in Hamilton who are absolutely crushing it and getting deals that are on the MLS that other investors just didn't want to cold call because it's not glamorous. I can spend three to four hours cold calling and get zero deals, but sometimes I get deals from it. North Bay, for example, like where I got a four unit there, I had no interest in looking in North Bay. I had zero properties there, but I just implemented the exact same strategy that I I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier. I was like, let's see what's stale. Let's call. Let's get creative. And I look at the comps. I look at the, I spoke to a commercial appraiser. I'm like, what are the cap rates around this area? I was like, okay, if I can, if I can stabilize this building, then this is like a, a home run. Right. And then yeah, it happened. It ended up being a home run, and I just flipped it instead. Uh, Cornwall. I have zero interest in Cornwall. I don't know any. I know like one investor in Cornwall. Exact same thing. I was a call and steal listings. I got a fourplex. Um, spoke to the seller's agent. We negotiated it down. Unfortunately, we we weren't able to get vacancies, but I dropped the price down from a hundred k, and then they literally told me. I did it. The the seller's agent said, I didn't know this guy would be willing to come down hundred K. No one's offered this before. That being said, I don't care if you take it or not. I'm going to relist it and get this thing sold. I was like, I'm not interested in it, but I'm sure you'll get it sold. He relisted it and then got an offer that same day, right? hundred K lower. So like, I think it's just like, it, it's just strategies that work in any, in any sort of market. You just got to be willing to, to put in the work. Yes, it is probably harder in the GTA, but Absolutely. I'm, I'm sure. No, I, and, and I, you know what? I'm glad you're mentioning this because most people, especially uh, newer investors, they they want to take the easy path and try to look for something here. And then they say, hey, you know what? Nothing makes sense uh, in, um, you know, 
Hamilton or Kitchener Waterloo, you got to go a little bit further. You know what? The some of these markets are still have uh, good fundamentals, um, and there's way less competition. You yeah, know? and and there's ability to create those deals, like they say, like great deals are not found; they're created. Mm-hmm. Uh, good deals are found; great deals are created. So you got to think outside the box, and you got to you got to create that deal. You got to figure it out. And um, I think that that's a really good takeaway from this: is that you know, you got to you got to you got to make it happen. You got to hustle. Mm-hmm. And you got to create those deals for yourself. You got to be hungry and you got to create those deals. So, so Austin, let's take it back uh, as we almost come to a close here. What motivates you? What drives you to continue to succeed? I mean, um, there's this, there's this zone of comfort that people get into and it doesn't seem like you're, 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 you know, you, you're talking about these six figure payouts. You're talking about these refinances coming in, the success coming in as a fairly young individual. Um, what motivates you to continue to drive yourself forward? Believe it or not, it is, it is harder to stay motivated as you get a little <laughs> bit more success. That being said, um, as I was go, as I went through my journey in real estate investing, I realized what motivates me most is building a balanced lifestyle, which is something I did not have the last couple of years. So one of my long-term goals is I'm going to still acquire real estate, but not as uh, the aggressive path that I was doing before, which is probably not a common answer for a lot of real estate investors, right? Like one of the biggest takeaways for me is, is that just seeing how people are impacted in real estate via leverage and leverage is great, right? Don't get me wrong. Lever- I would not have built the wealth without leverage, but in the long term, I want flexibility, peace of mind and a great lifestyle. So I'm going to scale my portfolio, trade them off and trade some properties off and then pay down like uh, us and own a smaller portfolio easier to manage. Right. So I guess what's keeping me going is, is that I do see that there's light at the end of the tunnel from where I am. Cause I'm not far off from where I want to be. Right. Uh, I don't need to necessarily take the amounts of risk that I was taking before. I'm planning to do it on a more enjoyable and, and, and stable path, but I got into real estate for freedom and I think I am able to achieve freedom, but much different than when I started, I was thinking unit count. Now, for me, it's not so much unit count, but how much are paid out, zero leverage, 100% cash flow, easy lifestyle, right? So yeah. I think that's kind of the path that I that I want to go down. And for sure. No, awesome. you're you're wise beyond your ears. So, um, you know, I, I really, that's great uh, that, that you've you've actually realized that at, at um, so early in your career. Cause- yeah, yeah, not a lot of young guys are saying that everyone. And, you know, it's I think it's interesting in the real estate world, like you said, how uh, everybody's always talking about door counts. Um, door counts, in my opinion, are an ego play. Yeah, I mean, door counts don't mean that much. Um, maybe we can talk about net worth. Maybe we can talk about cash flow. Maybe we can talk about cash on cash returns. We can talk about all these other metrics that are more indicative of the of a healthy portfolio, of a portfolio that has a purpose and fulfills that purpose, whatever your purpose is. And not everybody's is the same, but it's so funny how that door count has become a metric. It's like, yeah, I own this many doors and I own this many doors. And it's like, okay, you know, but let, let's dig deeper, right? So yeah. Yeah. Are they all joint ventured? Like what is, what exactly the net worth is the most measurable thing. And just to touch on something that you mentioned, like cash and cash return, like return on equity, so on and so forth. One thing that that it's also opened my eyes to, and I mentioned this, uh, I think on a rise podcast as well is, is that the the numbers can change because all of the numbers we look at are leverage. So for example, when you're buying these properties, like newer investors, they may buy our single family home that after refinancing cash flows a hundred dollars a month, but they only have a thousand dollars tied into the property. So the cash and cash return is 1200 divided by a thousand. It's 120%, right? But interest rates go up two or three times. Now you're, now you're negative, right? Like let's say you're negative like $500 every single month because the interest rates hiked up significantly. Now your cash and cash return is like negative whatever, like 60, 70, 600%, whatever. I don't know what the math is. It's like yeah. significantly negative, right? Like yeah. the returns are static, but if you if your expenses are variable, your returns, because they're leveraged, they can be very positive. But as soon as your cash flow negative, like just add a negative sign to that, what it was positively. And now you're losing like over a hundred percent every single month, right? So uh, I just want to caution again, investors, the returns are great and they're a great tool to measure apples to apples, which investment property is better. 
but also you got to recognize that they're all leveraged and that they could also change at the snap of a finger too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 100%. Very good advice. Um, yeah, just before we close off, um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about Rise, uh, Rise Network and uh, what you guys do on a kind of, you know, you have, um, are these in-person events? Yeah. Uh, some virtual uh, and some in person are they or uh, just tell us a little bit about your community mm-hmm. yeah for sure yeah so rise started really as like when i was scaling my portfolio and just other investors gathering together a lot of young people investing long distance but it, it's grown so much more than that um pretty much it's we, we host in-person networking events you just come out chill chat there's not really too many presentations from time to time maybe once or twice a year we'll have like an online more webinar sort of thing but really other than that it's just a super casual forum that's on facebook where if someone goes on rise right now it's just like filled with questions of people asking stuff other investors like giving the answers or sharing their opinions um there's not much advertising that goes on there. People can't advertise any wholesale deals, any JVs. It's just like literally a community for people to share their wins, losses, ask questions and support each other. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And um, I guess, you know, your motivation for doing that is to give back and to help others and and perhaps uh, bring in a community that you thought was lacking. Because um, I felt like that too, when we were younger and starting out, like a lot of the communities out there are more intermediate investors. Um, some of them cost money to get into and um, or, or a lot of money to get into. And when you're first starting out, maybe it, it's really helpful and, and more encouraging to have a younger network that you can kind of lean on and 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 friendships you can develop in a support system you can you can go to so that's pretty cool we'll link all of that in our show notes um i think that that's a really good initiative and uh hopefully people who are younger i'm, I'm guessing you may have some middle-aged investors who come out too for sure yeah yeah now now pretty much it's like every every age group it's evolved okay. more than, yeah. than the millennials awesome. when we started mm-hmm. yeah, so cool. uh austin now uh, what's the best way for people to get uh in touch with you and learn more about what you're doing Instagram is probably the best. You can follow me at Austin Ye6. I'm a social media butterfly. So okay. <laughs> that's the best way. <laughs> that's and cool. also check out Rise Network on uh, Facebook. And uh, your podcast. Yeah. Rise Real Estate Investing Podcast. Mm-hmm. Rise Real Estate Investing Podcast. Which awesome. we'll need to have both of you guys on soon as well. <laughs> so stay tuned <laughs> yeah. for that. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks again for your time. We really appreciate it. It was such a great conversation. And uh yeah. Thanks again, Austin. Thank you so much, Khadija and Jose. Okay. Awesome.